George R. R. Martin is an American novelist, television producer, and short story writer. I personally enjoy Martin's work because of his ability to craft narratives that are rooted in reality, sometimes even inspired from real-world historical events, while also peppering in fantastical elements to add a bit of spice to his overarching plots. Martin is the author of a series of epic fantasy novels, A Song of Ice and Fire, as well as a plethora of outstanding short stories, some interconnected. Martin's contribution to the world building of Elden Ring includes the creating of dramatic figures found within the past of the lands between, and the mythos of the world, essentially the game's history prior to the arrival of the Awakening of Our Tarnished. Specifically, Martin mentioned that he didn't include any Easter eggs in Elden Ring. He wrote, Why would I have to hide my name inside of the game? My name is right there on the game, as one of its creators. That being said, Martin's past narratives within his other works share some interesting connections, like extraterrestrial fungi mentally controlling the actions of those that it infects. More on that later. The majority of connections we'll be covering are from Martin's popular A Song of Ice and Fire series. Plot points, locations, and character details found in A Song of Ice and Fire can at times match those found in Elden Ring, possibly used as inspiration from Martin himself. Throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, multiple individuals play the Game of Thrones, each with their own set of motives and beliefs. Individuals with such strong convictions that they are willing to sacrifice others, sometimes even their own kin, for the sake of the Iron Throne. Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Both the Iron Throne and the great runes inherited by the demigods can taint an individual, creating a power for hunger, a hunger which leads to the devastation of those caught in the crossfire. One of the main contenders for the Iron Throne is Daenerys Targaryen. She believes it is her birthright as she is the last remaining Targaryen princess. Throughout Daenerys' journey to the Iron Throne, she utilizes the power of her dragons to free those she finds oppressed, earning her the moniker Breaker of Chains. When speaking of the current status quo, Danny explains that all the great houses of Westeros are merely spokes on a wheel. None remain on top for long, and as the wheel spins, it crushes those below, the common folk. She states it is not her desire to stop this wheel, but rather to break it. The wheel is symbolic of Westeros' social construct, each ruling great house taking a turn, but ultimately not changing the status quo. To break the wheel would be revolutionary, and would allow Westeros to enter into a new age. Within the Lands Between, Ronnie the Witch plans to do much of the same to allow her Age of Stars. She states that she must betray everything and rid the world of what came before, rid the world of the Old Order and its endless strife to bring about a new age. Daenerys uses her heritage of blood and fire to assume her rule, while Ronnie mirrors this using the heritage of her mother, Renala, to craft a new age of the night sky and moon. Both are exiled princesses from powerful families, looking to change the current order. Both sacrifice themselves in fire to gain autonomy, and both employ dragons to serve as their protectors. While Rani is associated with the night sky and dark moon, Dany is referred to as Moon of My Life by her first husband, Khal Drogo. Khal Drogo, also known as the Great Rider, was a powerful warlord of the fearsome Dothraki nomads. Within the Dothraki culture, they believe that when someone dies, the horse god parts the grass and claims the deceased for his starry tribe, so that the deceased can ride with him in the Nightlands forever. The Dothraki further believe that the moon is a goddess. Dothraki men wear their hair in long braids. They are only allowed to braid their hair after they have claimed a victory in battle. The braid is only cut when a Dothraki warrior is defeated, an act through which he lets the world know his shame. Braids are also found within Elden Ring, like the Giant's Red Braid and the Golden Braid. Helms such as the Elden Lord Crown, Young Lion's Helm, and Marias' Mask feature braids as well. Many characters of importance in the Lands Between wear braids in their hair. Within the ancient cultures of our world, braids were more than just aesthetics. They also held major cultural and social significance. Differing styles were used to identify age, tribe, marital status, and even social rank. Braiding was, and still is, a social art. For instance, ancient Egyptians believed that braiding hair could ward off evil spirits and bring good luck. The Dothraki reside in the vast inland plains of the Great Grass Sea, also known as the Dothraki Sea. These grasslands are inhabited by packs of wild dogs, jackals, herds of free-ranged horses, and the rare Harakar. A Harakar is a great white lion. Drogo hunts one down and gives its pelt to Daenerys. Dany takes the pelt with her throughout her journey to the Iron Throne, and its musty smell reminds her of her late husband after he passes into the Nightlands. What the white lion pelt symbolizes is open for interpretation. It could be foreshadowing a future event related to Jaime Lannister, as the lion is the coat of arms for House Lannister, and Jaime is a member of the King's Guard, who are nicknamed White Cloaks due to their appearance. Not to mention Jaime murdered Danny's father, giving him the title of Kingslayer. 
The white lion could symbolize strength, power, and courage, as lions have been a prominent symbol in heraldry, representing nobility and authority. The characteristic of a lion as a royal animal in particular is due to the influence of the Physiologus, an early Christian book about animal symbolism. Dating further back, ancient Egyptians believed that lions were revered as symbols of protection and guardianship, often associated with the goddess Sukhmet, the fierce protector of the pharaohs. The nobility and strength of the white lion within the lands between reminded me of the beast regent Sirach, once known as Lord of Beasts. In the lands between and Shadowlands, lions are a form of divinity, most notably the divine beast dancing lion. While in A Song of Ice and Fire, in the great port city of Yin, located on the Jade Sea, there are tales of a deity known as the Lion of Night. The legend explains that the Lion of Night fathered a son on the Maiden Maid of Light. This son was the god on Earth, who ruled the great empire of dawn for 10,000 years before ascending to the heavens. The descendants of the god on Earth ruled the empire after him, each ruling for a shorter time than the previous one, until the brother of the Amethyst Empress usurped her in what's known as the Blood Betrayal and crowned himself as the Bloodstone Emperor, ushering in the Long Night. The Bloodstone Emperor practiced torture, dark arts, and necromancy. He enslaved his own people, took a tiger woman as his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods of Eti to worship a black stone that fell from the sky. Some believe him to have been the first high priest of the Church of Starry Wisdom. The Church of Starry Wisdom, also known as the Cult of Starry Wisdom, is a religion followed in many port cities. Some consider it to be sinister. Arya Stark overhears the acolytes of the church atop their scrying tower in Bravos, singing to the evening stars. A church that worships a stone that fell from the sky reminded me of the Golden Order that worships a greater will, which sent a golden star as its vassal to the lands between. Albeit the Golden Star, aka Elden Beast, was not the first shooting star sent to fall upon the lands between. The first was Meter, daughter of the greater will and mother of all two fingers and finger creepers. Meter's tail fingers form a microcosm, which she used as a portal to receive signs from the greater will. Under the subject of philosophy, the microcosm-macrocosm analogy refers to the historical view which posited a structural similarity between human beings, microcosm, and the cosmos as a whole, macrocosm. Given this fundamental analogy, truths about the nature of the cosmos as a whole may be inferred from truths about human nature, and vice versa. An interesting new crafting material added in the DLC related to Meter is the Finger Mimic. These are light pink mushrooms used by those who wish to become fingers to induce hallucinations. They call these mushrooms the stillborn of the two fingers. The two fingers resemble dead man's fingers, a saprobic fungus, and now we have an item directly linking the fingers to mushrooms. The giant ants forced to serve as mounts in Noxtella also feature pinkish glowing eyes while under the control of the Nox. The light pinkish color is also associated with the bewitching branch, a tool used to control others, and the paralyzing magic used by the finger creepers. The Nox's mind control over the ants reminded me of the zombie ant fungus. The fungus infects ants, making them leave their foraging trails to find an area with a temperature and humidity suitable for fungal growth. Afterwards, the host dies, as the fungal enters its reproductive stage, where fruiting bodies grow from the ant's head, rupturing to release the fungus's spores. In another of Martin's work, Men of Greywater Station, five scientists are studying a planet covered with a fungus that has the ability to take over the minds of other organisms by releasing spores into the air. The fungus seems hostile towards any organism that isn't already under its control. Interestingly, Martin reused the name Greywater for a location in his later book series, A Song of Ice and Fire. In A Song of Ice and Fire, Greywater Watch is the home of House Reed in the north, a vassal house to the Starks of Winterfell. Bran is of House Stark. Is it possible that the Erd Tree is another form of fungi, spreading its spores and influence throughout the lands between? Another narrative crafted by Martin that showcases a hive mind and its powers of influence is a song for Laia. The novella follows two telepaths, Rob and Lyanna, who are invited to an alien planet to study why the native alien culture hasn't progressed for thousands of years. The native religion is centered on a jelly-like parasite called the Grishka. The natives of the planet allow themselves to be infected by it in their adulthood, and ten years later they visit a cave where there is a large mass of Grishka and allow themselves to be consumed by it. When interacting with the members of the native religion, Laia reads their minds via her power of telepathy to reveal how lonely they were before converting, and how the Grishka has removed their loneliness. After reading the minds of the converts, Liana disappears, leading Rob to search for her. Rob tries to use his telepathy to read the minds of the converts to find out if they know where she is, when a feeling of love overwhelms him, causing him to black out. 
When he wakes up, one of the locals tells him that after he tried to read the people in the cave, he lost control and tried to walk into the Grishka, and the rest of them had to render him unconscious just to get him out. Later, Laia communicates with Rob in his sleep, telling him that she went into the cave and allowed herself to be consumed by the Grishka, which she says is a link to the afterlife of sorts, where the minds of every person who has ever been absorbed by it live and share love without any loneliness. She pleads for him to join, but he rejects it. In the end, Rob decides to leave the planet to avoid his temptation of joining with the Grishka as well. Let's take a quick second to talk about fungi, the decomposers of our planet, with the ability to turn death into new life. Fungi have a natural ability to survive and grow in extreme conditions. Fungi are one of the first organisms to thrive in environments on Earth that experience nuclear activity, and therefore, high levels of radiation. This is all to say that some theorize fungi to be extraterrestrial in origin. Within Elden Ring, I believe Meter and her children to be a form of fungi. In a past video, I mentioned how the Erd tree and minor Erd trees feed off of the dead, which is why they are planted in proximity to catacombs. I believe the weirwood trees from A Song of Ice and Fire work in a similar fashion, as they too may be a form of fungi. At Winterfell and Raven Tree Hall, the dead of the First Men are often buried beneath the weirwood. The proximity of the weirwoods to the dead could relate to how some fungi break down dead plants and animals to get their nutrients. Children of the forest would sacrifice in the name of the old gods by giving blood offerings to these trees, referred to as heart trees. The weirwood's bark is as white as bone. Its leaves are dark red, like a thousand blood-stained hands. Faces are carved into the trunk of the great trees, faces that feature deep-cut eyes, red with dried sap. The faces of the weirwoods strangely seem to display human characteristics. We see Brennan Rivers evolve into the three-eyed crow through the power of the weirwood. The sacrifice of his body to the tree is used to gain the wisdom of its interconnected root system that contain memories of the past. Bloodraven is described as being so skeletal and his clothes so rotted that at first Bran mistook him for another corpse, a dead man propped up so long that the roots had grown over him, under him, and through him. Roots coiled around his legs like wooden serpents. A spray of dark red leaves sprouted from his skull, and gray mushrooms spotted from his brow. Sacrifice for knowledge is a key theme throughout A Song of Ice and Fire. For instance, Bran unknowingly sacrificed his own physical mobility to gain the knowledge of the old gods. Bran was obsessed with climbing as a child, as he explored the secrets of Winterfell. He enjoyed swinging from the gargoyles of the First Keep and feeding corn to the crows atop the Broken Tower. Although he was scolded from multiple authority figures to cease his climbing, it never stopped him. I believe his desire to climb was foreshadowing his later ascension to godhood by gaining the knowledge of the weirwoods, the memories of the old gods. Bran's ability to join the weirwood labels him a green seer. Green seers were once leaders of the children of the forest who had magical powers over nature and prophetic dreams called green dreams. To pray to the heart tree is to pray to the old ones, the nameless, faceless gods of the greenwood. In my opinion, Old gods are those that have been fused into the heart trees. They are the memory of everything that came before. The green seer and the weirwood become one out of sacrifice. It's known that a weirwood will live forever if undisturbed. The weirwood does not rot, and thus a green seer is theoretically able to live on forever through the tree. The way that Brennan Rivers fuses with the weirwood to ascend his knowledge to that of the old gods reminded me of Mikla's attempt to ascend to godhood via merging with the Halig tree, or how Queen Merica was absorbed into the Erd tree. Found in ancient traditions all over the world, the tree is a symbol of life itself, representing the totality of the universe in which everything is imbued with spirit. Within the background of the Elden Beast boss arena, there are seemingly an endless amount of golden trees in a void of space, possibly displaying other Erd trees on different worlds. Microcosm meets macrocosm. Children of the forest first gave blood and sacrifices to the weirwoods. This was then taught to the first men who continued the practice. They feed the trees to gain powers. For instance, an old legend states that thousands of captive men were fed to weirwoods to wake the old gods in the earth and shatter the arm of dawn through the power of nature. Within Elden Ring, Queen Merica does much of the same as she sacrifices endless to the Erd tree to gain its strength. Merica could have learned this method via the subjugation of her people by the horn scent as they sacrifice the shaman. In both narratives, the history of violence and sacrifice is taught to the next generation from the prior. In part two, I will connect Ashai in A Song of Ice and Fire to the land of shadow found within the DLC. Ashai is on the southernmost edge of the mountainous peninsula known as the Shadowlands. Thus, the city is often called Ashai by the Shadow. We'll also discuss Tyrion Lannister, Arya Stark, Robert Baratheon, Phantom Tortoises, Giants, and the magic featured in A Song of Ice and Fire. 
I'll even cover a theory crafted by Jack the Mimic. As always, thank you for listening to me ramble. I sincerely appreciate your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful week.